Welcome to Student Media Access Cable. Today's community forum show is with our National Historical Park Ranger, Emily Priggett. Emily, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks for so my name is Steve Kelly. I'm the host of the show today. And I'm excited because Emily is part of a park that I didn't even know about exists in New Bedford. Mm -hmm. So um, Emily, start us off with educating for people like myself who uh, I only thought of the New Bedford Whaling Museum. I've been there with my grandkids. Mm -hmm. But you have a park that is yes. beyond that, yeah. uh, encompasses much more. Right. So s tell us about that. Sure. Uh, I work for New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park. We are a national park that is in downtown New Bedford. Um, it is right near the Whaling Museum, which many of your viewers may be uh, familiar with. But the National Park Visitor Center um, has been there for a very long time. Actually, our national park was created in 1996. And some people are surprised to find out that there's a national park in the middle of a city. Uh, they're surprised that there's something east of the Mississippi that's a national park. Uh, but the fact of the matter is there are 15 national parks right here in Massachusetts, and this is one of them. And many of our national parks are not just about big canyons and trees, although many of the famous ones are. You know, you think of Yosemite or Yellowstone or Acadia. Mm -hmm. Those are national parks with those kind of natural resources. But our park is all about history. And so it's New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park. It's about the history that's there, mm -hmm. and it's about the whaling history of the 19th century. And that's a history a lot of people aren't terribly familiar with, even though it was one of the biggest industries in America and in the world for a time. Yeah, I think it was also responsible, uh, sort of the wealth that came from that was responsible for all the high-end architecture that you see when you go to New Bedford. Precisely. It was actually the richest city in America for a time, uh, per capita. Uh, Hetty Green, uh, a millionaire on, on, uh, in New York, was, was from New Bedford. Um, the whaling industry, the blubber from whale, whale oil, and, and other products from whale, baleen from some whale's mouths, all of those products put money in the hands of many, many people, made a lot of people rich. Uh, for some, it wasn't so much riches, but they were able to make a living from that, uh, from that business. Over 10,000 seamen were employed at one time in the whaling trade, uh, uh, and the height of whaling in New Bedford was in 1857. But for a number of decades, 1820s, 30s, 40s, New Bedford was really so-called the city that lit the world because the whale oil was used for lighting. And it was used in lamps, it was used in uh, candles as well, but, and it was used in lubrication and for other purposes as well. But really it was a very big, busy city way back then. So how do you honor the tradition of the city but still have room for the people um, who are against whaling and thought it never should have been done? That's a great question. Um, whaling, our perception of whaling has really changed over time. Back in the 19th century when whaling was at its peak, whales were seen by people as animals that have been put there by God to be taken. It's, it's basically, it's like floating money. It's there, we should just take it. It's there for us to use, to use their bodies for the whale oil. It's for us. Uh, nowadays, we've learned something about uh, the environment, we've learned something about conservation, and we realize you can't just kill and kill and kill whales and, or kill any species and not have some kind of a repercussion in the environment. Something's got to give. And so now we've gone from an industry that kills whales to we go out and look at whales, we whale watch. And a perfect mm -hmm. example of that is the Charles W. Morgan, the whale ship that was just visiting in New Bedford for nine days. It just left a couple of days ago. And in fact, it left yesterday, no, two days ago. And uh, it's going to be going out to Stellwagen Bank and out where they used to go hunting for whales, it's gonna go whale watching. They're gonna be doing some studying of whales before they mm -hmm. continue on to Boston, and they're gonna have a visit in Boston over there. But the oldest wooden whale ship anywhere, of all the thousands of whale ships that they built, this one last wooden whale ship, the Charles W. Morgan, built in New Bedford in 1841, is gonna be going out looking at whales. And we talk about that today. We say, yes, they used to kill whales. Nowadays, that's not the way people think about them now. We think about learning from them, studying them, and honoring them, and seeing how they fit into our world. Wow, and that boat is some 170 years old? Yes, now. yes, can you imagine? No. And it's still <laughs> there, it's still there, and it's beautiful. They just restored her, it was a huge uh, restoration effort. She's just been restored, and we got to go get aboard her, some of us got to go get aboard, those of us who stood in line, 
got to do that, and uh, it was very, very exciting. To see her back in New Bedford was absolutely a thrill, and if folks didn't catch her in New Bedford, maybe they'll go up to Boston in a few days and see her when she visits there at the Charlestown Navy Yard. Wonderful. So give me an idea of the size of the campus that you, that you have that sure. you would call the historical park and, and how it connects with uh, New Bedford. Sure. And, and New Bedford, um, some people think, has not a great reputation. And uh, others uh, who know it better mm -hmm. know that there's so many wonderful events and so many nice things to do there. So uh, give us an idea of the size of the campus sure. and then maybe we'll lead into some of the events that you have. Sure. Um, so the size of our national park is, is 34 acres, 13 blocks. But <clears throat> the strange thing about our park, or the unusual thing about our park, we don't actually own most of what's within our park boundaries. Most national parks, there's a gate, you go up to the gate, you pay a fee, and you know you're in the national park. In the case of our national park, we have two buildings that are connected. That's what we own. Everything outside of that, that's within the park, is owned by other entities. They're privately owned, they're city owned, um, uh, they're state owned. So it's a number of organizations work to, working together in partnership. We are a partnership park, as are many national parks nowadays, actually. Most people may not be aware of that, but some other parks like Boston Harbor Islands are also national parks. So it's this large park, but our actual visitor center is right in downtown New Bedford. And uh, there's a lot to do and see there. Some people may not know the wonderful things that are going on there. You may not read about them in your local paper. But I can tell you, because I've been working there for sev over seven years now, I go down, uh, go down every day to work, and I never tire of looking around and seeing the exciting things that are going on, the new shops and restaurants that are opening up, the galleries, the art galleries, the museums, uh, but just looking at the history that's there as well. So the old and the new, it's all right there in downtown New Bedford. All right, so um, downtown New Bedford, our studio is about 20 minutes south of Boston. Mm -hmm. How far away, what kind of a ride is it to New Bedford from there? Sure, it's about 40, 43, 45 minutes from here where we're sitting in the studio in Stoughton. So right. it's not far away, it's, uh, it, it's a very short ride. Okay, and what would you say to someone, uh, someone like myself with mm -hmm. two grandkids, um, <coughs> you wake up on a summer, you've got the kids for the week, and you wish you could find something to do with them, what would you say we'd do if we went down to see the wow. uh, Whaling Museum? Well, I would say... Whaling Museum, I keep... Actually, there are partners, yeah. Um, so the historic... The it's New Bedford Whaling National Historical, Historical Park, Park, and we're just a stone's throw from the Whaling Museum. Okay. The Whaling Museum, of course, is one of our partners, and it's a premier world-class uh, whaling museum. Mm -hmm. Our visitor center is just steps away from there. There's the orientation film. I would recommend that you'd park your car in the garage and come right into our visitor center and see our film, which is called The City That Lit the World. It's shown every hour on the hour. It's free. Mm -hmm. It runs for 22 minutes, and it gives you a sense in pretty short order of what is this history all about. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can look around at the exhibits that are there at the visitor center. You can pick up information about what to do and see. So what you and maybe your grandchildren might want to do and see, you might want to take a walking tour. You might want to go to some of the uh, museums that are nearby, like the Whaling Museum. You might want to stroll down to the waterfront because you're right on the Acushnet River where those whale ships used to leave from, but now where the fishing boats leave from. And so young people might be thrilled to see those fishing boats coming in and out, all of the activity on the waterfront, because New Bedford is the number one fishing port in America for the today. dollar value of the cat today, right now, and it has been for some 13 years. Um, excuse me one sec, I wonder, um, Roy, could we queue up one of the photos um, that we wanted, that uh, Emily has brought with us, a couple of photos and also a couple of videos. Right. Um, and there we go. Um, so could you tell us about this, this photo right here? So you're looking at the, the fishing port of New Bedford, and as I say, the number one fishing port in America. Now, last year, 80% of the catch that was brought in was scallops. So if people like to eat scallops or if they like to eat seafood in general, this is the place to be. There are a lot of hardworking people here in New Bedford. This is a real working port. So you will see some restaurants on the waterfront, but for the most part, most of the waterfront is reserved for the real work that is done yep. as a working waterfront. So you'll see folks working, mending nets and things like that. Wow. Yeah. So well, that, it's that, the real deal. It's, it, that's the thing about New Bedford. It's authentic. It's, it's not a gussied up kind of place. It is a real city. It's a real working place, but it's exciting. It's fun, and there are things to do and see. So what other things would you say that I should come down and do? I mean, sure. You have a list of events, I think, that uh, summer events, actually. Yes, yeah. Actually, there's one that's coming up this coming Monday, and it's called Ocean's Day. And I would recommend that. There's, it, it's, 
talks about the exploration of the whale ships that are no longer floating on the water, like the Charles W. Morgan. That's the only one that's afloat. All of the other whale ships that you can see today, well, you can't see them because they're underwater. And so we've so started. They've been sunk. They've, been sunk. <laughs> they've fallen, you know, through time. They've been sunk. Yeah. They've, they've fallen into disuse. They're at the bottom of the ocean somewhere. So that's one thing that there is to do. That's all day events going on this coming Monday on uh, July 14. There are guided tours every day at 10.30 and 2.30, uh, fully guided tours, uh, 45 minutes to an hour. There are concerts every Thursday evening. In fact, the first one starts tonight uh -huh. with the group Yap. They're going to be appearing there, and there's going to be a DJ there. Um, they start at 6.30, but tonight starts at 6 o'clock, but normally it's at 6.30 to 7.30. There are the 1850s ladies, you probably haven't met them, but these two ladies, Ruth and Abby, have come directly out of the 1850s, and they make their way through time, through this wormhole, and they come from their time period to ours, and they will talk to you about anything and everything. Well, they wow. have a couple of things that they do with the public, including Friday picnics from about 11 to 2. Bring a picnic lunch and hang out with them in our garden just outside our visitor center. Relax and spend time with them and chat about whatever your fancy is. And on Sunday, Sunday afternoons from 2 to 4, they play lawn games like croquet and lawn bowling and the other kinds of games that they would have had back in their time. So in, in the kids 1850s, in the 1800s. 1850s, in the mid-1800s. And so kids, adults, anybody can play that. What kind of video games did they have back then? They un no, they had no video games. <laughs> I know that's a revelation to you. They didn't have any video games. Their times were much simpler and slower back then, so they amused themselves with other kinds of things. So that's weather permitting. If it's rainy weather, that's okay. There are things that they do indoors. They have crafts and other things that they do. Um, there are exhibits inside our visitor center that people can visit. And by the way, this is all free. Every single one of these things that I've just mentioned that we have at our visitor center, these are all free activities. That activity on Monday, the Oceans Day, when Kelly Gleason from one of the national parks in Hawaii will be there. She's an art underwater archaeologist. She'll be coming and speaking. There's going to be a celebration. There's going to be crafts and activities. That's from 10 to 4.30. Uh, our documentaries film series, that's on the third Friday of every month. That starts at 7 o'clock, and that's films about the working waterfront in New Bedford. So right. you can see we're not just focused on whaling. We're also looking at what is New Bedford's water like today? What's going on in New Bedford today? And what is that trajectory from whaling to fishing? Because there are many parallels between those two. We went from this number one port in America and in the world for right. whaling, New Bedford was, to the number one fishing port in America. And there's a reason for that. Our natural deep harbor and the people who work there who have the skills necessary and the experience to carry out those uh, activities and the space that's devoted in the city to carry out those activities, the supportive services for right. the fishing industry, for example. That's part of the reason why we're the number one port. So we have all of these activities that support the stories of what happened in the past the whaling stories, but also what's going on in New Bedford today, the health of our waters today, the fishing industry today. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. And, and I think, Roy, you could come back to a picture. There we go. Um, so tell us, uh, what about the health of the water at a port like New Bedford? Well, it's had its challenges. There, there have been challenges over time. Listen, there's been industry right there in New Bedford. But given our newer standards, our, cleanings, our cleanup standards, the EPA, uh, and other agencies have come in to say this is this is what we need to do and they're also the watchdog if you will the watchdog agencies such as the Buzzards Bay Coalition and we work closely with them as well and these are folks who are watching and monitoring the water quality so it's getting better it's getting better in a lot of places are they, are they dredging I thought I saw they've them they've been dredging, dredging down there. that's yep. right they've been dredging they've been doing cleanups so it's getting better and better all the time and that's really exciting we're seeing more uh, the better health to the water and I think people's general um, enlightenment and knowledge about how water quality affects not only the fish that we fish for but our health that ultimately we're all connected you and I the fish that we eat the whales that are out there all of these elements are connect connected and I think people's awareness is much greater today than it used to be Good. so, so let exciting. me change gears for a little bit sure. I want to talk about a couple of things mm -hmm. um, I want to get to the idea of this group um, yep youth mm -hmm. youth um, yes, Youth Ambassador Program. Youth Ambassador Program. Mm -hmm. But before I do that, um, what about you personally? Like, how did Emily come to be a park ranger? 
well, it's kind of a long story, but essentially I was a teacher. Um, I had been a teacher for a number of years, and I was looking for something to do with uh, my summertime. I was uh, just not doing much of anything in the summertime, kind of idle, and a friend of mine, uh, actually my, one of friends of my parents, uh, said to me, you know, there are national parks. There's this national park in Boston. You might want to try out being a park service mm -hmm. ranger during the summertime. So I, I applied for a job, and I eventually got a job in Boston working at Boston National Historical Park, and I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. And I worked there for many, many years, and after a while I decided, well, you know, I'm enjoying this, but I, I'd started doing this full-time, by the way, because I had lost my teaching job through some budgeting issues where right. I'd been working. But anyway, I ended up working full-time for the National Park Service, and I did enjoy it. And after a while I decided, you know what, I want a little bit of a challenge now. I want to work in a different place. I want something a little bit new, and I found out about New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park, and they were looking for a volunteer coordinator. Okay. So not only could I be a ranger down there and talk about history and connect people with the history that's down there, but I also could manage these volunteers. And at New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park, we're a small park in terms of staff. We only have six or seven full-time paid people. Okay. A handful of seasonal rangers, but we have dozens and dozens of volunteers, about 100 volunteers. What's a volunteer do for you? Give me, give me three well, positions that a volunteer sure. would do. Sure. The volunteers in our park do everything from, and depending on the position, some are front desk greeters. They're, they're sitting at the front desk. They're welcoming all the visitors who are mm -hmm. coming through our park and telling them some of the places that they can go visit and orienting them. Some give guided tours. Some help out with evening events, some take pictures. Uh, so there's a whole range. Some help us set up exhibits. Sometimes we'll have a temporary exhibit, mm -hmm. and we need a strong back and someone who's good with putting things together. And again, because our staff is so small, we need people to help out with those kinds so of things. So if somebody in the audience wanted to work with you, so mm -hmm. this Emily lady is very exciting. She's very interested in what she's doing, mm -hmm. and I want to work with her. How would they? How would they do that? They could take a look at our website, uh, www.nps.gov. Maybe you can get it on the screen. Yeah, NPS.gov slash NEBE. So there it is. Yeah. There's my. Here we go. So the New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park right. is at 33 William Street in New Bedford. The phone number is 508 996 4095. And we have with us the lovely Emily right. Priggett, and Emily has an underspace between her first and her last name. That's right. At NPS, that's National Park Service. Service, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can go to www.nationalparkservice or nps.gov slash, and N-E-B-E -E stands for New Bedford. Right. All right, and you can also do Facebook, which Emily takes care of some of the Facebook for mm -hmm. her job. Right. Facebook.com slash N-B-W-N-H-P. Mm -hmm. Um, and by the way, um, they have an application, a free app for your phone by Shoreside or called Shoreside Industries. And what does that do for you, Emily, if you pull that app down onto your phone? Well, the amazing thing is it's not only an app or an application that you can pull up on your smartphone to give you a walking tour. It is actually GPS guided. It's ah. an amazing thing. I don't know if you've seen this. but. You actually, if you are there in New Bedford and you've pulled up this application on your smartphone, which by the way you can get from our website or if you come to our visitor center and you pick up one of our brochures, which looks Let's see if, uh, just Leo, like this. Leo might be able to zoom in. If you pick that up and you pick up our brochure like so, inside that brochure there's a little QR code that you can scan. Nice little scan right here. code there. Nice little scan code. You'd pick that up. Right, and at what's the visitor that center, and up will come this app, this application, the smartphone app, and so it's GPS driven. Means, as you walk around New Bedford through the streets, you don't have to be told you must go here or there. You can decide. I think I'll walk in that direction. That building over there looks interesting, and up on your smartphone will pop information about that particular building that's right nearby. It knows you're near a particular right. building. And so up will pop this information, and then you have choices as to, do you want to see pictures about it? Do you want to learn more about the history about that site? Do you want to read some stories about that? Do you want to see a painting that was done about that site? You can pull up options. So it's all about guided, it's self-guided options.
Well, not everyone wants to do a guided tour at a specific time. Well, that's certainly me. I, don't, I do not like the guided tours there as much. There you go, yeah. But uh, you've kind of cued me into something that's very special to me. What's your favorite whaling story? Can you, can you tell Ooh, us? Ooh, my favorite whaling story? I think, I think some of my whaling stories, actually it's kind of a scary story and it's not, it's not a happy story, but one of my favorite uh, <laughs> whaling stories uh, is written about, uh, about the whale ship Essex, where people were marooned and they eventually ran out of food, they were shipwrecked. Wait, and they when ran, was the Essex built? This, uh, the Essex was built in, I couldn't tell you the exact date, but it was in the mid-1800s. So let's was, say 1840, yeah, there was a 1840s, ship. Yeah, 1840s, and there's Essex. a ship, that the Essex, and it gets and marooned. It, and it um, sailed out of? And, and it sailed, I believe it was out of, New, uh, was it Nantucket? I think it sailed out of. I think it's actually sailed, sailed out, out of Nantucket, Nantucket and not okay. New Bedford. With and how it, many crew do you know? It, it, it would have been twenty-five to thirty crew members. Twenty-five okay. to thirty. Are they all male back then? Are They're they all male back then. All they didn't male, have any 20, women on board. No yeah, women on board. Yeah. And eventually, it gets shipwrecked, and there ends up being cannibalism. On the so yes, the, so it's kind of a sad story. A cannibal story. Yeah, a cannibal story. Yeah. If you read in the heart of the sea, you can read all about that. In the heart of the sea. So that's like your favorite. Now, why is that that's your one, favorite? Well, that's I don't know. I, mean. I guess a little bit sensational. Most memorable. Most. I think that would be the most memorable. <laughs> Maybe it's not my favorite. I think some of my <laughs> more favorite stories have to do with some of the things that I've read about, where uh, folks have come, uh, escaped slaves have come, for example, from down south. Uh, and they find their way onto whaling ships, some of those stories. And, and for um, what purpose, to, to gather a living, or do they go somewhere through the whaling ships? Well, they're, they're, trying, to get f they're trying to become free. Uh, some of the escaped slaves, the fugitive slaves from Maryland or other places down south who make their way to New Bedford and they find their one way onto a whaling ship, sometimes they are able to get seamen's papers from someone else. Seaman's papers essentially is like uh, the way a passport is used today. It says this is this person and this is who they are and their height and weight and all of that. But back then there were no photographs that went with those seaman's papers. It was just a description. So your name would be on there, your height and uh, the color of your hair and your complexion and that sort of thing. So it was rather vague. So mm -hmm. you could use someone else's seaman's papers. It would be possible so to do that. So this is a great segue into your youth Youth um, ambassador program. Ambassador program. Yes. So tell us about how that ties into this subject. So the youth ambassador program are, are a group of youth from New Bedford, ages 16 to 21, and they are folks of all different backgrounds. And New Bedford is a multicultural place. Folks of many different backgrounds and colors, as is New Bedford. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the people are from Cape Verde, which mm -hmm. is off the coast of Africa, the Azores, which is one of the Portuguese islands, there are Native Americans, African American. I mean, there's a whole range of people um, in New Bedford. Right. And YAP recently did a documentary, uh, or they created a documentary about their creating a new song, because this group creates songs, hip hop or rap songs, about history. And so they always as do research. As a result research. of becoming involved with right. the National Historical as a Park. Yes. So this youth ambassador program, yeah. one of the things they did is uh, sort of encouraged and engineered with these young people right. um, a, an ability to create a song about the history. That's right. So um, Roy, we have a video that would set us up on this. And I'm wondering um, if you might be able to do that. Could you um, set in place the video that would um, set up the Youth Ambassador Program and show what they've done through their attachment to the National Historical Park right. in New Bedford. The Youth Ambassador Program has pioneered a new approach of engaging diverse audiences around the country. YAP has made seven dynamic music videos using their talents to raise awareness and teach about history. And I can still hear the story from the wise men telling how they came with perfect timing. Environmental stewardship. And health and wellness with their nationally recognized video, Get Outside and Move. The party's just getting started. Let's get outside, come on, move your bodies. Let's play tag and play some kickballing. Let's play hide and seek in the garden. But now Yap is on to a new journey, traveling down to the Washington, D.C. area, experiencing outdoor adventures including camping and kayaking and witnessing the wonders of the National Mall. But this trip goes much deeper. Keeping within the tradition of Yap, 
these ambassadors visited several national parks, learning about the history of Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and the Underground Railroad. Their challenge, to use their newly gained knowledge to write a song, record it, and perform the song all in one week. Ride along with Yap as we will show you this amazing process, concluding with a live performance at the historic Fort DuPont in the heart of Washington, D.C. Before Yap leaves on their journey, though, they go to visit the house where Frederick Douglass first stayed as a free man, the Nathan... Um, Frederick Doug Douglass, tell yes. us that story, and then what we'd like to do um, is we'll have Roy queue up the actual video that yes. the kids made. Terrific. So, and I say kids, but obviously young... Young people. Young, right. young adults at right. 16 to 21. So. Sure. And the, these... The whole idea is to engage youth at, at every age, to be inspired, to be inspired about history, to get excited about history, to learn about their history. And we do that with many, many other programs, and I can tell you more about that later. But with YAP, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the first part of the question. <laughs> no, the, the, um, the house that we Oh, just yes, so saw. Frederick Douglass and the house. So that house uh, is the place where Frederick Douglass lived when he was in New Bedford. Many people don't even realize that Frederick Douglass's first free home was in New Bedford. He came to New Bedford with his wife, Anna, and he lived in New Bedford for five or six years. And there were several places where he lived in New Bedford, but that is one of the homes where he actually lived. You can see that house today. It still stands in New Bedford. And so, but it's tell the, the audience just a snippet about Frederick Douglass. Sure. So Frederick Douglass, I'm sorry. So Frederick Douglass was an escaped slave. He had uh, freedom. He was managed to escape from slavery. And when he came to New Bedford, he had the, uh, the name Frederick Bailey, Augustus Bailey. He came, stayed with the, with the Johnsons, and was encouraged to speak out about his experiences as a slave. He was literate. He could read and write. Uh, but they told him, you need to, we need to have someone who can speak uh, firsthand about slavery, because there were many abolitionists who were out there, and there were a number of them who were in New Bedford and in Boston and in other places, Charles Sumner and so many others. But the movement, the abolitionist movement, was looking for someone to be able to speak firsthand about slavery, and he could do that. They encouraged him to speak out, and he began to do so in Nantucket and New Bedford and other places. And it was that starting of speaking out about himself, his experiences as a slave, that really catapulted the abolitionist movement to encourage people to abolish slavery. So he was a key figure in that movement. Now at the beginning, people didn't believe him. People said he is not really an escaped slave. It couldn't be so because he's literate. He reads and writes. Look at how well-dressed he is. Look at how well-spoken he is. He certainly couldn't be a slave. And they were all naysayers, and they poo-pooed the whole thing. But, um, but he, he cited his experiences, and they were true. And he had written an autobiography, and that was another thing oh. that that, that proved to them this, these are true experiences. And, and the people in the YAP program, what did they do with that knowledge? So th what they did, they were inspired by that. They went and visited that home, among other places. They went down to DC, as you saw in that clip before, and they saw the places that Frederick Douglass, other places where Frederick Douglass had gone, had mm -hmm. lived. They visited um, Harriet Tubman's uh, various places where ha Harriet Tubman had lived and worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, they were inspired by those people who were fighting for freedom, who were fighting to escape oppression, who were fighting to escape slavery, and um, looked at the places where um, uh, people were providing shelter to uh, folks along the way who were trying to find the path and to that freedom. Was the Underground Railroad? The Underground first. Railroad, which is a really interesting term uh, because some people hear the term Underground Railroad and they think, well, it must be truly underground, literally underground, and it is not, at least not in New Bedford. Yeah. There is no underground place for the Underground Railroad, and it's also not a railroad. So you're not going to find tracks for the Underground Railroad. <laughs> um, the Underground Railroad is, is essentially a network uh, of people and places where uh, they could be protected. Safe harbor. Yeah. Safe harbor, thank you. Safe harbor for the people who were trying to escape slavery. So it was people trying to help one another, and it was uh, that network of people helping one another, whether it was by shelter, providing food, providing direction. Remember that if you were to, to be an escaped slave, uh, just the act of escaping from slavery, what, what an, a brave act that must have been, to know that if you break free from the plantation where you've been enslaved, if you're caught, you can imagine what would happen to you. 
and as family, an escape, yeah, sure. you and your family. So what would happen to you? So that was an, uh, a brave act right there. But once you, once you escaped out, where do you go? It's, it's a big, mm -hmm. this country is a big place. How do you find your way north? And so all the songs that we hear about, you know, Follow the Drinking Gourd and some of the other songs that we hear about, which were songs that led uh, escaped slaves to freedom, looking for the stars, following the stars, uh, looking for various signs along the way and looking for people that they've been told to look for to help them find the way up north, find their way to Canada, and find their way to freedom. Well, let's see if we can queue up. Roy, um, do you have this second video so that we can, um, and a quick thanks to um, Roy Cohen, our producer, and Leo McGowan, our, our camera guy, who do a fabulous job behind the scenes. And we've also got Mike Hammond, um, and Mike's in the, uh, in the studio, and they're also helping queue us up. And we have Tyler out there as well. Yeah. So he's been helping, uh, learning how to push the buttons up back. So uh, if we can play that video from the YAP program, I think it would be very uh, instructional for some of our audience. Around the roly poly, so get with the movement. Let's get it moving. What are you doing? Just get into it. You can play boggle to the park escape, or maybe you can play tag. And no time to waste, but get off of the computer. Just go and have some fun. Fresh air to justice, so why don't you go and get you some? Don't be a couch potato. Just get up on your feet. Go play a game or two and keep on rocking to this beat. Potato, it's a beautiful day. Would you play those games? Funny to go outside. I'm acting like a lame. Oh, I don't know why y'all ain't out with your friends. Learn about the city instead of just sitting there. A jet and land kicking in. I know that you're feeling it. Yeah, you can walk around downtown. Learn about the buildings that are all around now. Yeah, or you can swim at the beach. Talk about the water. You can learn about the sea. Learn how my city with the riches. Yeah, just a fish. And I know that's ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot you can learn, right? Never know till you go outside. See, I'm just trying to have some fun. We all need to live on while we young. Get outside and go play. It's your time. Check it, uh, live, I'm arriving, high is the horizon, quit your timing, it's all applying to my physical fitness, I'm your witness, National Park, rapping in the building, focus on your movement, come on to it, don't stop your moving, or you end up losing, to help you wave in your good old days, life's too short, too quick to fade, let's go outside, let's go play, let's make it last, not so fast, cause the way to go, is that path, uh. You need to get outside. Get, get, get outside. Move. You need to get outside. Get, get, get outside. Move. You need to get outside. Get, get, get outside. Move. 
Yo, you need to get outside where you live in the rich town or the ghetto side. Get off your couch, don't get in your car, and don't be a slouch. You got legs to walk. Come on, let's take a journey to the beach or park. Let's take a girl to see the sunset, seeing it dark. There's many places to be, why not? Outside the houses, where we gon' start. It don't matter where you're from, it don't matter where you live, it don't matter if you're grown, it don't matter if you're a kid, it don't matter if you're old, it just matters if you live. So get outside, no matter who you is. Can't wait for life to happen. Lights, like lights, camera action. When camera snap, it take a picture when you see a scene. Like the Everglades or the Yellowstone Springs. There's so much land to see. Acres with history. So much activity. There's nothing to do. Why you kidding me? You know that that's a lie. I can be your tour guide. Open eyes, open mind. Now tell me what you find when you get outside. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Isn't who that would have something? thunk it? Who would have thunk it? The thing is, <laughs> the thing is, um, there are things that Yap can do. There are things that Yap can accomplish that some of us can't. Let's face it, uh, hip hop and rap is big among a certain demographic, right? Yeah. Younger people are into that. That's one way that they communicate with each other. You know, it's it's oh, what I could see you kind of thinking <laughs> it. Don't you think? Yeah, you know, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> so not everybody is into hearing a tour or or learning in a certain way. And so Yap really does their research. They find out, they figure out what they're going to be talking about, and they do their research and they create these hip hop pieces and these raps and right. such to share with other people because that's going to engage. They're contemporaries the way some of us just can't do. So that's, that's one type, the get outside and move, and that obviously encourages p the kids especially right. to get outside and move. So that's, that's a health message if you want to look at it that way. That's a, you know, we know that kids spend so much time looking at screens. And I heard that something like eight hours a day on average, the kids are just looking at a screen. Wow. And they almost d don't get outside at all. You and I, of a certain age, um, we got outside. Listen, we spent it's summertime. Age. We'd be outside all day, right? Right. Um, you get out in the morning after breakfast. You'd be out all day, and then finally, when supper time was called, you know, mom go ah, supper, and then you'd go inside. You were outside all all day, and you were running around, playing baseball, whatever you're doing. You were exploring, and kids aren't doing that as much now. It's a real problem. So that's one message that they have. But they've also researched on history. One of their uh, videos that they did on the 54th Regiment. Is really terrific, and people can take a look at for the uh, for these videos on YouTube. They can go to our website or take a look at YouTube, and they can look up the Youth Ambassador Program and and find them. But one of them is on the 54th Regiment, and I don't know if you're familiar with them or ever heard of them. But if you've seen the movie Glory, the Massachusetts okay. 54th Regiment was an all-black regiment during the Civil War, okay. and uh, they fight with great honor, great distinction. In fact, one of the uh, men who was in the 54th Regiment was William Carney Jr. and he was the first African American Medal of Honor recipient. He was from New Bedford. I mean there were schools named right. after him. The, you know there's there's a park that's named for him. There are exhibits outside that that talk about him and, and his history. So they they made a video about that. They've made a video about about other uh, items of interest that have to do with history. Researching New Bedford history or the Underground Railroad and talking about that in a way that is accessible to other young people. And we're trying to let all of this history be accessible to people of all ages. So we have everything from story hours uh, called Whales, Tales, and Sales, uh, which are for little toddlers ages zero to three and their parents or grandparents or, mm -hmm. or guardians or what have you, um, all the way up to things for adults to do. But we have youth programs, we have the Junior Ranger Service Corps, for the kids fourth to eighth grade. We've got the youth leadership program for teenagers. So there are all these different programs. We're really trying to target different age groups. We've got a, some, the Something Fishy Camp, which is a one week free camp for New Bedford kids. And they come in for a week and they learn all about the ocean and fishing and the sea and, and resources and there's hands-on activities and learning and fun and harbor tour. And, uh, it's a whole range of activities and it's a week long. So we have a couple of sessions of that during the summer. 
Uh, our place is busy. Uh, bring me back, if you would, to somebody visiting for a day. What would the day start off? Mm -hmm. how, how would it go forward? What happens at lunch? And how does the day mm -hmm. end? Tell me what the typical visit with Emily at the National Historical sure. Park in New Bedford. Well, it might start in our visitor center by seeing our film, our, our film which is shown every hour on the hour. After that, it might be a little tour, a quick tour through the exhibits. And then after that, depending on what they want to do, it might be a few hours at the Whaling Museum, which is right nearby. And, and is that a cost, the Whaling Museum? That does cost. There's a small fee to get in there, but it, well worth it. But um, your, your particular part of it is not a cost. Ours is absolutely free. Okay. Our, our visitor center is free. After that, let's say they visit the Whaling Museum for a little while. Let's say maybe they're there for the morning. Uh, and then maybe it's lunchtime. And, and Maybe they wander around and see what's there. We can show them in our little book of menus what's, what's around. But let's say you wanted a homemade um, soup. There's a homemade soup place nearby. There's and they're Portuguese travel food. On cobbled roads, right? Cobblestone Talk streets, a absolutely. Bit. Tell me about those cobbled yes, streets. Yes, there's, str there's slate and cobblestone streets. Well, you know. They're very uneven. Aren't it, they? It's very uneven. You've got to be careful. And the, that's the streets themselves. Are, they're, technically, they're called Belgian pavers. Those rectangular blocks that are in the street uh, are Belgian pavers. The cobblestones, technically, are those rounded things. But, so, and, and those we've got were in both. place because they didn't, hadn't invented. Well, they hadn't invented uh, asphalt. You know, they didn't yeah. have asphalt. You didn't have streets that you needed for uh, for the uh, the cars yet cars hadn't been invented you had uh, co you know horses and buggies and things and then they were so carrying heavy loads off the ship carry load heavy so loads off a, the ship a dirt rutted street that wouldn't work, wouldn't work too well and actually you can still see there are runners the uh, the granite runners that go down some of the streets if you look down on Rose Alley which is off of one of our streets mm -hmm. uh, that goes from between Route 18 and Water Street you can see uh, in Rose Alley, right in the middle of the street, there's this granite sort of paver right in the middle, and that was to facilitate the rolling of the barrels of oil up the street, uh -huh. literally, again, to make it easier to roll them up. But anyway, so you'd go and you'd find some lunch somewhere, and yeah. it, might be, it might be Portuguese food, it might be Thai food, it might be Mexican food, seafood, certainly. There are so many wonderful seafood restaurants, but all of this is fresh and delicious, and the prices are really terrific. We are blessed with so many restaurants in downtown New Bedford. You can't believe it. A new Japanese place just opened up with sushi. A seafood restaurant just opened up on the waterfront not long ago. So there are so many choices. You're spoiled for choice. After lunch, depending on what you feel like doing and seeing, you might want to stroll up to the Roach Jones Duff House and Garden Museum. Is that part of your? It's w part of our national park. It's, a, again, a partner of our park. And it's just about a half a mile from our visitor center, so it's a short stroll, or you could drive up there. So, Emily, you brought with mm -hmm. you a couple more pictures. So, I did. Um, Roy, I wanted you to cue up one of the pictures, and I think it shows a dancing. That was exactly the oh, one. Oh, yes, the Madeiran dancers. <laughs> so, tell, so if you were on your tour, you might see, tell us a little bit about Well, there this. are festivals that go on very, on, uh, very often during the weekend. So if you check our website, you'll find out more, or if you go... Later on, you'll see the destination. I'm, I'm not sure if you've got that up, but if you go to destinationnewbedford.org, you can find out more there. But uh, there are the cultures that are all over the city that are still very much in our city that came from the whaling times are celebrated in mm -hmm. New Bedford. And so through the various cultural events, you'll see things like this. These are Madeiran dances from the island of Madeira, uh, not far from Portugal. Yeah. Uh, so this is the sort of thing that you'd be seeing in New Bedford. Um, Cue us up some more pictures. Sure. And let's this have is Emily one of the walking tours. Sure. This is one of the walking tours that we offer, and you can see that actually it's a volunteer who's who's offering this walking tour. One of our volunteers, Jane, is offering the walking tour, and um, uh, these again, you can see the streets, you can see all the surfaces, the brick and the and the cobblestone, and then you can see the the Belgian pavers and the brick behind. So it, it, it's these old historic buildings, and and Jane does a wonderful job of of describing the history that's there. So you really you're living it. You're right there living that history and yet it's and it's you're this outside. lively place and you're outside <laughs> you're outside and that's good you're walking around and it's not a a long long tour that would be uh, a, a, a terribly challenging thing but it's just a nice little stroll walking tour nice and slow uh, usually about 45 minutes long that really and delves into the history this is free these are twice a day during the summertime mm -hmm. 10 30 and 2 30 and they're free and you just gather at the visitor center and you don't need a ticket or a reservation you just show up and you say yes i'd like to take that guided tour 
Okay. And Show we've us got more of these uh, photos. That's, this is sure. Great. This is the 1850s ladies. Ruth and Abby are there on the right, and they've joined. Uh, the, there is a family that's joined them for their picnic out in our garden, and anyone is welcome to to bring their own picnic. Uh, and join the ladies at their picnic just outside. And these are on Friday afternoons from 11 to 2. And it's, it's great to chat with these folks. Uh, they're straight out of the 1850s. You can talk to them about anything at all, uh, where their clothing came from and, yeah. and, and how much things cost and who the president is. Back then, of course, because they don't know anything about right now. But they can <laughs> tell you who the mayor of New Bedford is back then in the 1850s. And so they've studied all the period data. They know all of that, what's going on. And they can tell you about the struggles that are going on in the country right then in the 1850s wow. and uh, they're just absolutely charming pre and a lot of War, fun right? yes right pre-civil war yes oh. yeah so it's an interesting time this is the nb line this is our shuttle called the nb line and you know what it's only one dollar it runs during the summertime every day um, is it a dollar on, a dollar off? It's no, it's a dollar unlimited travel all day. So a dollar were, for the day. For the anywhere. entire day, they give you a little wristband to wear for the whole day. And there are two different loops that you can travel. So one of them is the downtown loop. Mm -hmm. And it just takes you around downtown. And it runs every 20 minutes. And then the other loop is the Fort Tabor loop. There is a Civil War fort at the other end of New Bedford, from where the downtown yep. visitor center is, at the other end, where there are beaches and there are antique shops and a Civil War fort, and you can visit all of these places. Now, is that part of your historical? It's park not group? within our national park, but yet we offer this shuttle that for a dollar will get you down there because we know that our visitors don't want to just stay within the national park area. We're, we're aware mm -hmm. of that. They want to go and explore different parts of New Bedford. And can they you swim down there? You can. You can so swim you can down there. You can go, go make Bedford, a day of it. Bring your bathing suit, see the museum. Go down, go swimming, or go up to the Roach Jones Duff House, as I mentioned, this, mm -hmm. this whale merchant's home. Go see that. Or go to the art museum. There are so many things to do. But yeah, you could take that, that shuttle and for unlimited travel, explore New Bedford and then decide, you know what, maybe today we see the Civil War fort and maybe we come back on another day and go exploring the antique shops. Right. So this is the Yap Group that I mentioned before. These are the folks who create these wonderful videos uh, that you can see on YouTube and check out. And at our, these are all New Bedford. These kids. are all New Bedford young people, all New Bedford youth, ages pretty much 16 to 21. It's changed a little bit over time as some of them age out yeah. and, and newer folks come on. But the amazing thing is, is that we inspire them, they inspire us, but really the important thing, they inspire so many other people, especially young people. Young people are the future of our park. Right. We're all getting older. All of us are getting older day by day. We need to be bringing in more young people into our parks and get young people excited about our national parks, about our state and local parks as well. We need to get people excited about their history. And this is what YAP is doing. This so is what that group is communicate doing. Communicate very clearly, if you would. Why should you get excited about these parks? What's the reason to do that? Well, these parks are one of a kind. Our national parks are one of a kind we have 401 national parks, and each one was created through an act of Congress, by an act of Congress. It literally takes an act of Congress to create a national park because it has to have national significance. It's not just that I or you or I like something or we say, oh, this is a nice place. It should be a national park. So that's not the way it works. You have to convince Congress that a place is so important that it has national significance and that the nation, Congress, the American people will support that national park every year with funds. That there is going to be a structure there, let's say a visitor center, yep. whatever the national park is, or that the resources such as the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, the Statue of Liberty, uh, Gettysburg, mm -hmm. Battlefield, all of these places are national parks. There's a reason for that. It has national significance. So, all of these places must be supported because there is meaning. Not just that there is meaning of the past, that they were something important many, many years ago, which they were, but all of these places have relevance in our lives today. We can all connect with these places today. And so the story of whaling, for example, is not just about, yes, New Bedford went whaling, 
and this is what the whaling story is about in the 19th century. But what does that story mean to us today in 2014? What does that story of whaling, how is that a cautionary tale about ecology, about conservation, about mm -hmm. caring about our resources today? How are you and I connected? How do you and I connect to the story of the Underground Railroad and how so many escaped slaves came to New Bedford to find freedom either on whale ships or in the shoreside industries? What does that mean to struggle for freedom, to struggle to find risk in what you do, and yet to find reward in many cases in the whaling story? So, so that really sort of allows someone who doesn't have that knowledge to embrace the past. Exactly. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. So um, I'm going to jump into our credits, that we're going to roll credits okay. right now. So uh, Roy, you had a couple that you wanted me to do, and then we'll switch to the, uh, the pre-taped ones. So Roy can run those. So the Stoughton Farmer's Market is going to be held, and is being held at the First Parish Universalist Church, a great big Thank you to the folks of the Universalist Church at 790 Washington Street in Stoughton every Saturday, 10 to 2. This is a nonprofit volunteer run uh, farm in which you can get farm fresh produce. Um, it runs right through October 25th and it is rain or shine. A couple of really nice uh, farms, Lane Gardens Farm and Fresh Cash Seafood, O'Brien's Bakery. And we have another farm, but I can't remember it, so I have to apologize. There's live music every single week, so you get to hear that. Um, what else do we have, Roy? We have the Stoughton Lions Club presents the concerts. These are three concerts for Stoughton in Faxon Park. Uh, on July 20th, coming up, is Political Asylum. And this is a great group, I think, of seven musicians who've been together for a thousand years. And um, during that time, they have never gotten paid for a single assignment. They have always contributed everything um, for a charitable cause. So they, uh, they really are a great bunch, and they're good to see as well with a lot of skills. On July 27th, The Villainaires. On August 3rd, Outside City Limits. On August 10th, It Is What It Is. And then on August 17th, our own Roy Cohen and two of his high school chums are gonna come back and play in the same way, locked in time, frozen in time, as they did when they were teenagers. So uh, that's gonna be an interesting thing uh, some 100 years ago. Uh, so that would be an interesting show to see uh, on August 17th. It is free admission, um, and it's right across from the library at Faxon Park. We also have Support Our Library Association in Stoughton, SOLA. Um, the library is at 84 Park Street in Stoughton, and you can email them, solastoughton at gmail.com. The Stoughton Library does an amazing amount of uh, work for the community, um, everything from the book reading program to learning languages, all different things, uh, a great resource. And the phone number there is 781-341-0856. Recover from the loop. Hi, it's Gary LaPierre, and the crew wants to thank mm, 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 Maxie's Delicatessen. And that's at 117 Sharon Street in Stoughton. They're 781-341-1662. American Cancer Society, yes, they're looking for volunteers, drive cancer patients to and from their treatments, 1-800-ACS-6662, or just go to www.cancer.org. Ilsa Marks Food Pantry in St. Anthony's Free Market, 2 Park Avenue in Stoughton. For more information, call Christine Gallagher, that's at 781-341-0611, or 781-341-0549. Meals on Wheels, just ask for Jessica. You'll find her at 781-344-8882, extension 2. Stoughton Penny Saver, our business is advertising your business, they tell us. 27 Rose Glen Street, Stoughton, 781-344-4833. Community Forum Showtimes in Stoughton. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 6 p.m., Monday at 8 p.m., Tuesday at 5 p.m., it's on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 28. All comments and suggestions welcome. Contact us at communityforum1 at yahoo.com. Community Forum Showtimes in Easton. Mondays at 9 p.m., Tuesday at 8 a.m., Wednesdays 3 p.m., Saturday 10 a.m. And that too, Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 22. Samaritans, they're at 41 West Street on the fourth floor in Boston, 02111. Their phone number is 
24-hour helplines for Samaritans, and the number is 877-870-HOPE. That's 877-870-4673. Samaritans, you can find them at 800-252-TEEN. That's 252-8336. Or find them online at SamaritansHope.org. All right, and we're back on the show, Community Forum. And I'm here with Emily Priggett. Yes. Who's the National Historical Ranger for New Bedford. Yep. Right? And New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park. National. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we have a couple minutes to wrap up. Yeah. Um, what sort of things, what else would you like to tell the audience about your park? You know, there's also a wonderful once a month activity. It's an arts and culture event. And it's held on the second Thursday of every month, and it's called AHA, A-H-A, apostrophe, <laughs> uh, uh, exclamation point, A-H-A, -A uh, exclamation point. And A-H-A, AHA, stands for Arts, History, and Architecture. Art, History, Architecture. And what it is, it's a free event, second Thursday of the month, in which there are music concerts, there's dance, there's crafts, there's lectures. It's all free. It's, you know, first night. First night is kind of this fun, activity-filled yep. evening. Yep. That's once a so year. So this is a mini. This is like a little mini thing, but it's every month, second Thursday of the month from 5 to 9 p.m. So some of the things that we have going on at our visitor center, for example, tonight we have a, uh, a concert every, uh, that's okay. again in our garden. But also we have the 1850s ladies, Ruth and Abby, and they offer crafts. Out beyond our visitor center, though, you're going to find a whole host of activities. It's somewhere around 40 different venues holding all different activities. You can pick up one of these schedules in our visitor center, and they list out the locations, the times of, of all of those things. These are all free events. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing to be able to come and to spend a full evening. And it's all kid-friendly, family-friendly, so it's not like you're going to have to worry about who you're bringing with you, your grandma, your little kid. It's OK. Everything's fine. It's a lot of fun. And this is generally uh, very free? I mean, it's not... It is always free. AHA events are always free. And yes. is there a website they could look up what's on for this particular month? Yes. If you go to ahanewbedford.org, Wow, they that have their own the site. So they've got their own A H A New Bedford yep. N E W B E D F O R D dot org. Right. AHA New Bedford dot org. If you go to that website, it lists all the things that are going on. Well, it sounds very exciting, and volunteering for you, what, what would be the number that we would call you? Or sure. Is you can call our visitor center at 508-996-4095. Yeah. My extension okay. is 6105. So 508-996-4095. And, and my extension is 6105. So the audience can talk to Emily directly at that number. Absolutely. And then you could key them in on some things that they could do either as a volunteer mm -hmm. or just to come down and enjoy the facility. Absolutely. And I hope that people will because it's such a wonderful place. And I'll bet a lot of your viewers haven't been down to New Bedford in a long, long time. It's time to come down. It's time to come down and check out New Bedford and the wonderful things that it has to offer. Well, I think that's just been a terrific interview. Um, I'm really uh, thankful. I, I happen to like New Bedford. Uh, um, I'm charmed by the city. And um, I think it's uh, a great place to go and spend time with your family. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. All right.